our penultimate speaker uh, was a proponent of high quality intervention into high custody, high conflict custody cases for decades before the International Handbook of Parental Alienation came out. The International Handbook, drawing on scholars from all over the world, was his brainchild with Richard Gardner. And that the team for the International Handbook of Parental Alienation, which brought together uh, attorneys of the quality of Barbara Sobel, who's done cases in The Hague of, of uh, children uh, from abducted from far-flung far flung places, David Levy, uh, Bill Burnett, Chris Barden, uh, incredible expertise. The, the, the team was Richard Gardner and Richard Sauber. And so it was a fabulous team in the sense that there was, there was a gracious, eminently qualified expert in the evaluation, in the objective uh, and scientific evaluation of child custody issues who taught in medical school after medical school, ran faculty departments, taught graduate students, and there was Richard Gardner. And, and it was a wonderfully operating team until, of course, Richard's untimely death. And then the gracious, eminently qualified, expert custody evaluator, uh, the, uh, the, the guy that got his training in, in that particular area at, at Harvard and went on to uh, teach and run departments at uh, Brown, Columbia, University of Pennsylvania, uh, the, the guy who was uh, gracious to a fault, uh, polite, uh, helpful, uh, was a board certified uh, clinical and family psychologist, uh, needed the help of a maniac to corral all these cats from all over the world and get them to, to actually do what they were supposed to do and write in the same format and write in the same freaking font and and participate uh, in a, on a timely basis. If you've ever worked in a faculty a department of psychology or psychiatry and tried to pull a group project together, you know how ridiculous that endeavor can be. So, so somehow the family decided to bring on this lunatic lawyer uh, to help this eminently qualified uh, founding member of the board of directors of the American Academy of Mediators and, and uh, uh, someone who helped to create the uh, National Academy of Professional Custody Evaluators and who was on the advisory board of the uh, Children's Rights Council to help him pull this project together and actually get it to a publisher that respected the work. And uh, it was my uh, incredible honor and pleasure uh, to pull that project together and to work with the eminent uh, Dr. Richard Sauber. Thank you for that fine introduction. Wish to acknowledge and appreciate those of you that were able to delay your plane tickets and make arrangements to be here late on Sunday afternoon, especially being in New York City with lots of other choices. Last year at the uh, Canadian Symposium, I spoke on forensic evaluations and many of the procedures and ingredients that go into comprising this kind of evaluation. And I've seen many of you here this weekend. So this presentation will be different than that of last year's. And what I'd like to do is talk about why forensic evaluations are preferred to, to, to traditional psychotherapy in helping the alienated child, differences in approach and outcome. When I thought about this title, uh, there's two terms that were somewhat troublesome. Uh, one was the term preferred rather than the word effective, and the other is traditional psychotherapy. And the distinction between traditional psychotherapy 
and what may be called PAS therapy uh, is highlighted this weekend. In particular, that those of you that have attended can no longer consider yourself a traditional psychotherapist because once you've been exposed to PAS, you can't erase it from your mind, you can't forget it, and should you have a case involving PAS, you know and you will not resort to traditional, comfortable style psychotherapy, and you know you have to do something different to be effective. So the reference to traditional psychotherapy no longer applies to you. And when we talk about uh, PAS-related therapy, toward the end of my presentation, I'll talk a little bit about that and some of the advantages of uh, having this kind of focus because the talk today will include uh, irreconcilable differences between traditional psychotherapeutic care and forensic uh, approaches in which you may say, well, uh, there's limitations to the psychotherapy role, but it's not really true that there are limitations. It's just that it's a different twist and you will have a different role. In fact, you'll have a choice whether or not you wish to go to court. Many psychotherapists say, I don't want to handle these kind of cases because I don't want to go to court. Well, at the conclusion of my talk, you'll have a way out if you wish not to go to court. And if you wish to go to court, a way to control what you say so that the opposing attorney is not able to attack you or criticize or make you feel uncomfortable with some of the tricks that attorneys employ all the time. So that uh, these will give you some different options of how you wish to approach your role. Now the term preferred versus uh, effective. The reason I did not use the term effective is because it implies it's a measurement construct, that you can measure the effectiveness, which is complicated because if you conduct a forensic evaluation, one, at the completion of the evaluation, you have a report. In that report, you have findings, and if you've done a good job, it's very effective, but effectiveness spreads to several other layers. The second step, once you've completed a report and submitted it to the court, and you have to submit it to the court with a copy to each attorney, the next thing is, what is the impact of this evaluation and influence upon the judge? So it's a second level of effectiveness. The third level of effectiveness has to do with the judicial order of implementation of your recommendations. So when you measure the effectiveness given these variables, uh, it's questionable. You could do a great job at the first round, even at the second, and fail at the third, and that really doesn't uh, speak well to your effectiveness. So really, it's preferable in terms of what you can do within one's purview or professional role as opposed to uh, that which you can't control, and that's the judge's uh, dis ultimate decision. In fact, when you conduct an evaluation, it's recommendations to the court. You don't tell the court what to do. You say these are for your judicial considerations. So out of that came the title and the use of certain words. So what I'd like to do is talk about the irreconcilable differences between therapeutic care and forensic examinations, and then go into the irreconcilable differences in the role of a child and family therapist, and cover about eight factors under each. Now, when we talk about uh, the effectiveness of therapy, uh, often therapists, as pointed out by several speakers during this conference, have talked about the damage to the alienated child and the damage to the case. And that often we have 
with every alienating parent, a therapist that acts in a confirming, supportive, advocating role for that alienator. So it's quite important that we understand that psychotherapy as traditionally practiced is different with PAS cases. Now we have on the bench busy judges and when judges hear all kinds of family disputes, it's easy for them to say, well, let's refer it out to a therapist or a family therapist. So it's a convenient way to discharge that whole area and not have to get into family disputes. So that often judges will make referrals and the only thing they have to contend with is the selection of who's the therapist. So whether it's going to be mutual consent or by appointment of the judge, uh, a therapist is selected, or a therapist may have been pre-selected, taking the alienating parent's side and already be a part of that case, in which case there's no need for a further appointment of a, another therapist. Now, when it comes to a psychological evaluation with the courts, uh, there are a couple difficulties to implement that. It's not that simple as many of you have experienced when your attorney files a motion for uh, whether it's custody evaluation or psychological evaluation or evaluation of any sort. Judges take the attitude if there's an evaluation that's more court time. We got to hear the results of the evaluation, got to hear the results of depositions, so it extends the court time. The judge is also thinking about the financial aspects that that's an expense, not only for the evaluator, but for the attorneys and all the people involved in that evaluation. And that evaluation perpetuates the conflict. It's a way to further extend the separation from one side versus the other side. And finally, it requires another judicial decision that the judge has to take into consideration or give weight to the evidence presented by the evaluator. So it's not uh, an easy automatic uh, consideration for a judge just to appoint an evaluator. Now when we think about uh, a therapist being uh, an expert in court, there are a number of considerations. Uh, some of you may be familiar with ZUR, Z-U-R Institute in California, who does a lot of online continuing education. And within the last month, I have to notice a new CEU came up called, is it kosher for a psychotherapist to serve as an expert witness? So he, one among others, have raised that issue. Now he used the term kosher rather than ethical because in this country, uh, the ethics word with regard to dual roles, and I'll talk about the therapist role versus an expert witness, is irreconcilable and that there are conflicting interests, but yet they're often overlooked because judges say, well, I wanna hear what so-and-so therapist has to say about the child. After all, they've been in therapy for the last three months, four months, 15, 20 office visits, we wanna hear from the therapist. Now, in, uh, this is a Canadian symposium, and it's interesting, in Canada, they are quite clear in differentiating the role between a fact witness and an expert witness. And that is clearly an ethical violation if one serves as an expert when in fact one is a fact witness, which is a therapist in the sense that a therapist is defined as an advocate for their client and that they take the position, they've heard from their client and they advocate for the client as opposed to a uh, forensic examiner or expert witness that goes to multiple sources for objective data from varying kinds of uh, individuals that may contribute. An example might be 
of a case where a therapist got involved consulting with a family where one of their, their boys was in having disciplinary problem at school. So he met with the teachers at school, met with the parents and child, and then the parents filed for divorce. And the father subpoenas the therapist to testify, feeling as if uh, the father was a major disciplinarian of this acting out teenager and would be able to speak to the advantage of the father in a custodial way. And when asked the therapist, do you think that the father would be the better parent for this particular youngster? Well, the fact witness would say, these are my observations about the father, but I can't give an opinion about which parent would be the better parent because I haven't examined all the variables that take place. For example, what if the father undermined the mother's authority where when the, mo when the father's not in the house, she's quite capable as a disciplinarian? So that this therapist following the Canadian guidelines of ethical procedures would stick to the fact that they're a fact witness and not an expert witness. That does not mean that they don't have expertise in what they're doing. It's just they're not applying a forensic model to a therapeutic clinical situation. So that there is a dual role of the therapist and the expert witness and a conflict of interest. The, uh, again, the therapist is considered an advocate for the patient or the client. And the language is improper dual relationship. The bias is in favor of the client. And even when termination of therapy takes place, there's still considered a therapist bias. What I'd like to do is flash on the screen, William, if you'll put the, I only have two, uh, if you do the other one first, please. Uh, only two, pre two uh, screen slides for you, so it'll make it easy. Uh, if you could do the first one first, which is the reference. This is an article from a number of years ago. that talks about the irreconcilable conflict. So it's not a new concept, it's been around for a while, it just hasn't gotten a whole lot of attention. And then if you could flip to the second slide, which defines some of the 10 variables involved. And just to highlight some of these differences, in therapy, there is a broad set of issues as opposed to forensic matters. It's narrow, it's the fine set of events or circumstances that's the focus. In terms of the client's perspective, therapy focuses on understanding the client's point of view, whereas a forensic focuses on the accuracy in the client's point of view. In terms of being a voluntary, in therapy, the client is voluntary versus a forensic situation. It's the judge's order or the request of an attorney in which the client is being examined. The area of autonomy, in therapy, there's a lot more latitude in terms of client objectives and their concerns and considered a wide variety of areas, whereas a forensic examination is confined to applicable statutes, legal elements that pertain to the legal issue in question. There are threats to validity in terms of the therapy situation. There's unconscious distortion, intentional and conscious distortion, and control of how the information is used and with regard to informed consent. Whereas in a forensic or expert witness situation, there's no side taking, there's objective and third party validation, there's consistency of factual information across multiple sources, and malingering and deception assessment of feigned symptoms is part of the 
evaluation, consideration. And we talk about the relationship and the dynamics that occur. In therapy, we have a trusting and empathetic therapeutic alliance and advocacy role, whereas the forensic may not ethically nurture the client or act in a helping role. There's divided loyalties, there's limits on confidentiality in the sense that nothing is confidential. You avoid the manipulation in the adversarial context of a legal setting. And there's emotional distance to determine the truth. And I'd like to read a quote from an article that's in press with the American Journal of Family Therapy that speaks to this issue. A voluminous body of research conclusively supports the significance of a strong therapeutic alliance to positive outcome. Meaning that we have a strong therapeutic alliance with our clients, it's going to influence a positive outcome. Although within the therapy literature, there's a struggle to reconcile the issues of alliance versus neutrality. Take, for example, on gender issues or extramarital affairs, there's moral positioning. There's what's called engaged neutrality versus relationship advocacy. And incompatibility between emotional neutrality with strong emotional alliance. All these kinds of considerations. And then with regard to some of these differences, we have the pace and the setting. And the therapy, many, many factors affect the pace and it's done in an office setting, where in a forensic situation we have court schedules, limited resources, other external factors such as time constraints, and there's a finality of one's opinion. As mentioned by one of the other speakers, you can always revise your hypotheses in therapy, but when you do a expert witness evaluation or testimony, you only have one shot at determining the accuracy and the truth of the matter. An ethics consideration is there's confidentiality with regard to therapy, whereas in forensic or expert witness, all information may be used which is not in the client's best interest. So if you're a therapist and an expert in a case, and you might mention certain things about your client which is not in their best interest, will compromise the therapeutic relationship. Now when we take these considerations and we put it in the role of the child and family therapist, we have another set of irreconcilable differences. The first is establishing rapport with the alienated child, the alienating parent, and the rejecting parent. And good luck in establishing a rapport with those opposing forces. Then you have the cognitive dissonance on the part of the therapist. Which story to believe? The traditional one dictates accepting the child's convincing and compelling statements because children don't lie. Accepting the charm and narcissistic manipulations of the often sociopathic preferred parent and the feeling of disgust and repulsion and dislike for the targeted parent because that's how the targeted parent is presented. Therapists have to deal with the economic consequences and considerations of how do you keep a case what happens if you take the side of the targeted parent? How long do you think you'll be continuing to see this particular case? Challenging the child will cause therapist rejection. The alienating parent will inform the therapist that the child no longer likes the doctor, no longer wants to see that provider, does not feel comfortable in treatment, and the termination of treatment begins and whether there'll be therapist shopping or just the end of therapy, either one could occur. But what does happen is that the therapist cannot retain a case in which he can remain neutral and be effective. 
So we have now the indoctrinated therapist joins the chorus and becomes an advocate treating and offering expert testimony against the targeting parent. And that's where various speakers have talked about the damage that a therapist can do in these kind of cases. Now the therapist's attitude may be attacked or criticized by the evaluator, but they have to defend their status quo, never to admit a professional error or lack of knowledge, training or expertise in this type of alienation case. Because after all, they are the selected child and family therapist, either court appointed or self appointed, and they'll continue to defend their position with their last breath. So, what do you do in trying to find a therapist that has some information, knowledge about PAS that would be effective? Well, if you are the client, or even a professional trying to help out, and you call around to colleagues and ask, are you familiar with PAS? I have a case I'd like to refer to you. What's the answer you're gonna get? Oh, I know all about it. I've read Dr. Gardner, and they're quite familiar with it, and will begin to speak the language. Or say, uh, this is not a good time to discuss it. Can I speak to you tomorrow? In which they'll review their notes and give you the position that they're highly qualified to deal with that kind of a case because in this day of economic competition among therapists, among other people, uh, here's a case that's being handed to them and they're not about to indicate that they're not qualified or capable of handling it. So it's very difficult to find someone that is qualified with PAS other than say, did you attend one of these conferences? Or some other way to determine that this person has had experience in working with these complex problems. <laughs> now, once one becomes a, let's say, a PAS therapist or a therapist dealing with PAS cases, uh, what is the most effective role that you can play? given that if you begin to challenge the child's belief system or the reality that the child is presenting, you won't last very long as the therapist involved in that case because the alienating parent will make sure of that. So what you can do is document, document, and document. Now this role of documentation will be helpful not only in the therapeutic role, but also should you go to court. Because as I was saying earlier, uh, a role for a therapist is to be a fact witness. And when you're a fact witness, you can talk about observation and documentation without offering an opinion. So a good file has all kinds of documentation particularly among the symptoms of alienation of the child and among the strategies, 20 or so that Dr. Baker identified last night that are utilized, and these are things that you can well document in the record. Uh, just to point out one uh, consideration since I referred to economic uh, aspects of this, uh, when one is considered a fact witness you get a check from the attorney that subpoenaed you to be present, typically in the amount of $7. Sometimes it's six, sometimes it's seven. If you're lucky, it's $8. So you wanna have a agreement with the people that you're working with right from the start that should I have to go to court, uh, you would be responsible for my regular fee or my fee for going to court. Otherwise, you're stuck with a $7 fee sitting in court, waiting to be called upon and being harassed through a cross-examination. So that may be something that you'd wanna include in your fee schedule. I'd like to talk about some case examples about traditional therapy versus PAS therapy and then I'd like to 
give you an example of an order that's from a judge to a therapist. And you may think, well, how would you handle this kind of order that the judge is requesting upon the therapist? Well, you have a complaint. Dad does not feed us. He never has any food in the refrigerator, and what little food he has, we don't like. Now, a traditional therapist may respond, what do you tell your dad when you're hungry and there aren't even snacks for you and your sister? Maybe you could end the visit before dinner instead of after dinner. You like your mom's cooking better than your dad's anyway. What would a PAS therapist, how would they respond? They would say to the children, in this case there's several girls, daughters, is this your handwriting? Your dad gave me these menus that you and your sister prepared, which shows choices in appetizers, main meals, and desserts. And how the two of you enjoyed cooking and going to the food store, selecting and preparing meals. And when you show this to the children, you get a classic answer. We hate cooking, he made us do it. But the therapist is prepared having an orientation with PAS says, here are some photographs of you cooking with an apron and a chef's hat, holding up a cake you just baked, the table you set, and you seem to be having fun and smiling in these pictures. So the PAS therapist has to come armed with other sources of information to challenge and question these children. Or you have a, another complaint. There's nothing to do at dad's apartment. We are bored. We cannot, cannot even watch TV shows we want to watch. Only what he wants to see. Well, traditional therapists may say, sounds like there's nothing to do when you visit your dad. But at your mom's house, you're busy with all your friends in the neighborhood and doing all the regular activities you do after school. Maybe you could explain to your dad that at your age, you'd prefer to be more with your friends than your parent. Whereas a PAS therapist might say, what activities do you like to do? Does dad do these things with you or take you to these activities? What about swimming? You and your brother seem to be having fun in this picture with your dad and you in the pool. You're throwing the ball to your dad, having a good time. Now you said that he will not take you to see movies that you want to see. He only wants to see what he wants to see. What about these Walt Disney movies you saw with him? Could it be that you saw that you, could it be that you see your mom and dad fighting with each other? And since you live with your mom, you take her side. She tells you all the bad things your father does. I can understand why you do not like him. What if we found out what your mom has told you about your dad is not true? So you can begin to challenge these kinds of belief systems the children have. The problem again becomes one of how long you last as the therapist before the alienating parent works some means to have you dismissed. Now, a court order that gives you uh, the authorization for an indefinite period of time to provide therapy is one way uh, to uh, continue your appointment and be effective because in that case, the parent will try to object to your continuation, but will have difficulty because you'll have enough documentation and challenging to present to the judge that what you were doing was effective therapy, and even though the child may not be comfortable or the alienating parent uh, objects to your techniques, they are effective ones. Now, I was given a, a woman came in, she was referred from a psychiatrist in a neighboring community. 
and lived uh, north of where I practice, uh, just south of Orlando. And she asked, how can you help me? I've had two prior therapists with my son, who's 14, 15, who doesn't want to see me and refuses contact. And these two other therapists uh, were not able to work things out. And in fact, no longer were willing to be involved in the case. I said, well, it'd be helpful to see the judge's order and get some idea of how to approach this. And I was quite uh, surprised to find the judge's order, which is in many ways a terrible order. On the other hand, it provides what a wonderful opportunity. Now the order is for temporary time sharing and family therapy. It reads, this court will not force a 15 year old to visit with his mother against his will. The court directs that a copy of this order be provided to the family therapist for the purpose of advising and instructing the family therapist as to the nature of the therapy and the reporting requirements in connection with the therapy. The next aspect of the same order is numbered one, two, three, the nature and scope of family therapy. The family therapy shall be for the family and consequently, the mother, child, and as necessary, the father shall participate in the counseling. Now we say the father, he is the alienating parent in this case, and as necessary shall participate. The purpose of the therapy is the next item of the order, is to address by way of appropriate counseling and therapy. First, the child's indicated fear of his mother child, I understand, is about six foot two, quite stocky, and plays football. And his mother is short, somewhat obese, and soft-spoken. So the second comment was to address the allegations that the mother has struck the child. The third item, to address the allegations that the mother has kicked the child out of her home during visitation. Fourth item, allegation that the mother has forced the child out of her car during visitation. And fifth, that the child does not feel safe with the mother and is distressed about visitation. The judge says the requirement for the time sharing with the mother is that the minor child must feel safe and it is not and is not distressed about visitation. The, the judge in his ultimate wisdom asks for a report from the family therapist. The family therapist shall have an initial conference with the child for the purpose of asking the child if he wishes to visit with his mother. If the child indicates he does not wish to visit with his mother, the therapist shall issue a written report indicating the same to the court. If the child indicates to the family therapist that he does not wish to visit with the mother, then the family therapist shall inquire as to what time share schedule the child desires to exercise with the mother and shall a written report indicating the child's desire to visit and the child's desired time share to schedule for the court. At the conclusion of the said family therapy is the next item in the order. There's quite a lot of details that the judge outlined in this particular case. At the conclusion of the family therapy, we'll issue a complete and detailed report to the court, advising the issues as set forth in the paragraph above, setting forth what progress has been made in family counseling, regarding the relationship between the mother and the child and the status of the relationship between the mother and the child. Uh, that's an unusual order from a judge in that much detail. But the question is, how do we approach that? Now, 
the two former therapists, one was named as court appointed and the second one uh, selected to terminate. The second therapist uh, withdrew from the case because no matter what time she offered this 15 year old for an appointment, he was too busy. And he was only available in the evenings and on the weekends. And she didn't work on those, that kind of schedule. So the, the task was how to get myself appointed as the family therapist in which would I act as a family therapist? No. What I would indicate to the judge in this situation, before beginning therapy, I have to know what I'm doing therapy for and to know if these allegations are true and to understand what the adolescent's refusal of having contact with his mother is all about. So I have to evaluate the circumstances and then determine how to approach this therapeutically, which would then lead into the forensic evaluation as an expert witness, rather than limiting uh, my role to a fact witness in this particular case and meeting with the child, meeting with the mother, and maybe the father, and trying to figure out how to present this. What I said to the mother, speak to your attorney. Do not give my name as the psychologist you're proposing at this point, because what happens is the other side will Google or call around and they will find out my experience in these matters and object to my presence. Instead say, I found a psychologist who's an old timer and he works around the clock. This guy, he works in the evening, Friday night, Saturday, Sunday. It doesn't matter, he's always working, he's a workaholic. So it doesn't matter what my son's schedule is, this guy's available. I figured for a couple of appointments, which would be all that I could hope to uh, get out of this case, uh, or would last with this child, I'd be willing to meet with him at whatever hours uh, the child was agreeable to. So where this case is, it's in the process of the opposing attorney saying, we've had two therapists, they haven't worked out, we're not, we don't need another therapist. And the mother's therapist trying to say, we found the psychologist and he's willing to have a flexible schedule and meet with my son at any hour and work this out. And hopefully the credentials and things like that do not come into play, but rather my willingness to meet at whatever hour with this child. So in each of these kinds of cases, the task is to be creative in figuring out what role to assume in this position. Once you assume a role, you can't change roles and switch to another role. So if I chose to limit my role, in this case to a therapist, I could not be a forensic evaluator after that. But I first, but what I want to emphasize to each of you is although there may be ethical constraints in terms of dual roles as a therapist versus an expert, using expert as a forensic evaluator, it still does not limit your impact on these cases. The advantage of going to court, if you choose to go, if you don't want to go to court, it's very easy to say to the uh, client or the subpoenaing attorney, I'm limited as a advocate for the client because I'm the therapist I cannot give a professional opinion ethically, so all I'd be doing is repeating certain facts in the case which you already know. The mother has the dates of the services and the father knows some of the procedures that I've met with the child and the mother and the father and this kind of thing. So you can minimize your effectiveness and uh, generally get out of going to court. However, if you wish to go to court, you can also use that to your advantage. Once you're an expert 
uh, you're an easy target for the cross-examination and the attorneys to try to use you, the direct examination trying to pull out things that you would not ordinarily say and try to have you say those things and then defend them when you're being cross-examined. So as a therapist, you can very much play an effective role by saying, I have to limit my comments to my observations and report the procedures and the things that have occurred without offering an opinion. And although it may be frustrating for the judge and other people that want to ask, well, what do you think of this and that? You can clearly stick to your role as a fact witness, present great observations, all kinds of documentation, which is a PAS therapist uh, major uh, role and attribute to provide to the court and be quite effective. And as well, getting compensated for your contribution in that role. Now, in the previous speaker, Brian Ludwig's presentation, he talked about light therapy being feeling-oriented or traditional kind of therapy and reconciliation kind of therapy. Well, this term really equates with the term reunification therapy. Many of you are familiar with that term rather than reconciliation therapy. Well, what's the problem with reunification? One is that the alienating parent wants to participate in who is going to be the reunification therapist. And they're in there pitching for their person, and the targeted parent wants to have the choice. After all, he's the victim and hasn't seen his children or her children in an extended period of time. Because reunification is only after an extended period of time in which he or she has had no contact with their children. And that's a difficult task. And uh, to be a reunification therapist uh, involves a lot of skill and training of how to deal with these conflicting forces. And very often uh, is defeated in that effort that the child refuses to have contact and the reunification therapist says, there's nothing more I can do. The child refuses and that's it. So one of the things that I have recommended to get around this when there's a request for reunification in a complex PAS kind of case is called a reunification plan. Now you won't find this in the literature because I made it up. And what I had in mind is with alienated cases, it's pretty well out there what's going on, and you need a backdoor approach to conduct an evaluation. So you indicate to the targeted parent's attorney that you would like to do a reunification plan. What is that involved? You need to meet with the principal players, the parties, the children, each of the parents, and this is a person that has not been involved in the case. Also, to meet with and collect the data and review the reports of the treating therapist, if there's been a custody evaluation, the PC, and often the GAL, which stands for guardian ad litem. Often guardians are not attorneys, but are lay people that volunteer to be friends of the court and help and assist objectively, as the expression is, objectively presenting the child's best interest. But along the way, they become confounded and contaminated often by believing the child and the uh, charm of the alienating parent. So that this evaluator for a reunification plan meets with all the parties, collects the data, and has really done a custody evaluation in somewhat disguise, and then is ready for the battle in court. And the presentation in court is simple. Judge, we can't have a reunification process in an environment 
that's contrary to any success. So you begin to raise questions about the residential status where the child's living, under what conditions, and the way in which the child's therapist is advocating the, the child is frightened of the targeted parent and therefore shouldn't have contact. So you begin to examine the cast of characters and is it a possibility or an impossibility and what changes have to be made before reunification is possible? What makes this particular plan and strategy effective is that it's a constitutional right that you have contact with your children, alienated or otherwise. And usually, many of the allegations become frivolous ones so that, the, that you beat your kids or you don't do certain things with them or you molested them. They go by the wayside as unsubstantiated. Nevertheless, you have a child that refuses contact with you and hates you. So a reunification plan is a must, and we need to come up with a way to effectuate this that makes sense, and therefore calling for a plan. And when I've done these kinds of cases, I am not the reunification therapist. So that way I'm saying I'm not recommending things that I should be doing as a therapist. This is passed on to someone else to do the reunification therapy, I'm just suggesting what the plan would be to increase the likelihood of success. So that would be uh, another tactical approach in these kind of complicated cases. Uh, what I'd like to do is leave a little time for some questions. Uh, one of the questions posed to me was, when you have a court date that's been set, even if it's sometime down the road, and you're asked the question, how do I find a therapist for my acting out alienated child? Well, the answer to that I'll often give is don't find a therapist. That you've been struggling this for a long time, and chances are that if a therapist is brought in, they're gonna be used as an expert advocating therapist when the other side in favor of the favored or alienating parent. So it's my suggestion is to avoid other therapists unless you're confident that you can bring in a trained PAS therapist. In my own practice, in my local community, because often I'm, uh, I travel to other communities where I don't have the benefit of this situation, there's a local therapist, licensed mental health counselor, who does nothing but divorce work. In fact, she teaches the divorce course and has a following of many clients that go through the course and end up in divorce counseling with her. So what happens is either I get appointed for an evaluation and I say we need a therapist involved and offer several names and steer the person to meet with this individual, a woman, and see if you feel comfortable with her and all the parties agree that she would be the therapist. And once that takes place, to have her court appointed. On the other hand, when cases come in and she sees there's alienation and complex issues, she'll say, what we need to do is have some psychological testing and assessment to learn more about each of the children and each of your personalities. So I'd like you to see this doctor to do some testing and evaluation. And she's quite persuasive and often gets the family to agree voluntarily to meet with me, in which they then sign a paper indicating that they agree to participate in a family evaluation and those results will be available to the family upon completion of the assessment and that we have permission for the therapist and I to speak uh, during this progress. So we have an understanding. So what happens is when we go to court, we have a well-trained PAS therapist that presents 
I present, our findings are 100% consistent, and those consensual data, and the cross-examining attorney and opposing side know that we're a pretty formidable team, and they're in trouble. And often the case is settled. So that's one of the ways that you may consider in your practice of teaming up with a forensic evaluator or being the PAS therapist or evaluator either role and working with another colleague in this capacity. In fact, uh, I drew up a document which we have the individual sign indicating that each of us maintain an independent practice. We charge separate fees, different fees for different services, and each of us work independently and their findings may or may not agree with one another. So right from the start, when complaints start to occur and the individuals start to recognize certain patterns of behavior and what's being documented, they can't get out of it or they can't try to sabotage the relationship that I have with the PAS therapist. So that's an example of uh, one of the ways that I can be more effective in my role in dealing with these complex cases. Okay, if there are any other questions, I'll take those on the side. Thank you very much. <laughs>